Welcome back to Computer Science 340. This week we're talking about hash tables, which are a super important data structure that show up all the time. Now, a hash table basically associates two pieces of information. You have a key and you have a value and you use the keys to sort of like look up values. So sort of a standard example is a phone book type of thing where somebody's name is their key and all of the information that you want to store about them, like their phone number, their email address, their physical address maybe, is the value. And so you put in information like, okay, Bob lives at this location and has this phone number. Sally lives at this place and has this phone number and so on. And then you're able to look up the information again by the key. So you can say, tell me Bob's address or tell me Sally's phone number. And it gives you that information really, really quickly. So that's the main thing about a hash table is it lets you sort of like store information by keys and then look up that information again really, really fast. And now that we've done algorithm analysis, we'll be able to look at just how efficient a hash table is for this thing. So like I said, they're really widely used. You'll, you'll see them a lot in programs and use them a lot in your own programs once you sort of get the, uh, the scope of them. So let's go ahead and start talking about that. All right, so as mentioned, the goal of hash tables is to make searching as efficient as possible. And we've so far basically have seen two ways that we could use data structures to do searching. One is either an unsorted array or a linked list, which actually it works out as the same thing. And the other is the sorted array. Now let's talk about the analysis of this just a little bit so we can see where these numbers are coming from. Okay, so imagine we have either a linked list or an unsorted array. As I said, the analysis for it kind of works out the same either way. So imagine that we want to insert into one of these two data structures. What do we have to do? Well, for the linked list, we jump to the tail location and then we make a new node, we fix a couple of links, and then we're done. It doesn't matter how big the rest of the array is. There could be millions and millions of nodes and we would just do the same thing, jump to the tail, make a new box, fix some links. It takes the same amount of constant time no matter what. So the insert there is big O of one. And it actually is the same for an array as well because what you'll do for inserting into an array if it's not sorted is you'll just jump to the next available location, wherever that is, put the new data value in and then carry on. Because it's unsorted, you don't need to like insert it into any specific location. You can just put it wherever is next available. Now it's possible, of course, that we will have to resize this array as we talked about. If the array is full, we'll have to like make a new array and copy it over and that will take time, but we would do it in such a way that that very, very rarely happens. When we did this, I think we talked about doubling the size of the array every time we have to resize. And if you do that, it works out that in the long run, you're basically never having to resize except for very, very rare scenarios. And so on average, this is also big O of one for inserting into the unsorted array. So that's very fast. That's a good thing. But now we have to think about searching. What do we have to do if we want to search one of these two data structures? Well, for the link list, we have to start at one side, let's say the head, and we have to look at every single cell one by one as we go. For the unsorted array, that's true as well. There's no order, so we can't like guarantee or expect that the value we're looking for is in any particular spot. So again, we have to start in the beginning and just search through the entire thing as we go until we find it. So hopefully it will make sense that that's big O of N, which is not very efficient. We could do better than that. It's big O of N, like we, we talked about this last time, even though you might find the thing early and you might find the thing at the very, very end, on average, we'll find it about halfway through, which would be like about one half N. And in big O analysis, we drop the coefficient. So it's just big O of one, just to, or it's just big O of N to go over that real quick again. So for the unsorted array or the linked list, inserting is very good, but searching is not very good. Now let's consider the other possibility, which is that we keep an array of sorted data. Here we have an array that's sorted. And now if we want to do the search, it's going to be more efficient. If you remember from when you talked about this in 220, I think most of you talked about this in 220 anyway, there's an algorithm called the binary search algorithm, which only works when an array is sorted. And what it can do is it basically works 
by jumping into the middle of the array and seeing if the thing we're looking for is less than or greater than the item in the middle. And so if we were searching for like uh, 26 in this case, we could eliminate the whole right half of the array right off the bat. Then we look in the middle of whatever is remaining and we could eliminate the whole left half of that right off the bat. And so binary search is much, much faster than linear search. We'll actually analyze this algorithm in more detail in a couple of weeks when we talk about searching and sorting algorithms. But for now, I'll tell you it's big O of log N, which isn't one we've seen yet before, but big O of log N is quite good. If you have a linear algorithm, it might look like this. When we compare, you know, oops, what is it? The input size N to the number of steps of the algorithm, but a logarithmic curve grows very, very slowly. It would look like this where even for large values of n, it's going up very, very slowly. So this is actually quite good to have big O of log n here. That's a very good thing. But now our insert isn't as fast as it was before, because now imagine we want to insert a new value, like let's say 17 into this array. Well, we can't just go ahead and stick it in the next available slot, because then the array wouldn't be sorted anymore. We can't stick it there. Instead, what we have to do is we have to stick it in the spot that it will have to go in to preserve the sorting. And so to do that, we're going to have to shift these things over one by one to make room for it. And again, sometimes we won't have to shift at all. Like if we're adding a big number, it'll go at the end. That's fine. Sometimes we'll have to shift basically everything if we put something in the very beginning of the array. On average, we can assume that we'll have to shift about half of the array most of the time. So again, that would be like one half n, but we drop the coefficients anyway. So this is big O of n, which is not great. So basically with the things we've seen so far, if we want to be able to insert data into it and then search for that data back again, we don't really have a great way of doing it. We can use a sorted array like this, but that which makes searching fast, but that makes inserting slow. Or we could use an unsorted array or link list and that makes inserting very fast, but searching very slow. So the goal of a hash table is to be really good at both of these things. For a hash table, the goal is to have insert be big O of one, which is as good as you can do, constant time, and search also to be big O of one. So that's the aim of a hash table, is to be basically as efficient as possible for storing a bunch of data where you want to insert the data into the data structure and then search for the data afterwards. It's basically ideal in both of those scenarios. Now, as we'll look at, a hash table is just a little bit more complex in a way than an array or a linked list is. You can't, with a hash table, just always assume you're going to get this ideal best case scenario for the insert and the search time. You have to make sure that you set it up properly and sort of like pay a little bit more attention to make sure that you get this ideal scenario. But this is why hash tables are so widely used in such a great data structure is because when you do those things properly, which again, we're going to talk about this week, of course, when you do those things properly to make sure that your hash table is set up well, you have basically the best case scenario that you could ever expect to have for searching and inserting like this. So how does a hash table work? Well, it's based on an array. You have an array for storing your data and we're going to insert and search from that array. But unlike an unsorted array, like we talked about, where we just stick stuff onto the end, or the sorted array where we keep it in sorted order, we're going to be treating the array a little bit differently. So let's talk about how that works. We're going to put things into this array in such a way that we will know where to get them again. And so, Imagine that our keys are strings and we have a name like Alice that we want to insert into the hash table. Well, let me put some numbers on here. I'm trying to use more color, by the way, so that this isn't uh, just all black text on a white background. But okay, so we have these uh, 10 slots in this hash table. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, Alice goes into slot, I don't know, seven. And then inside of slot seven, we'll put Alice and we'll put any other information that needs to be stored alongside. Like if we're doing the phone book thing, maybe we put her phone number in here. Then when we have another piece of data we want to insert, we'll decide Bob goes into slot, I don't know, three. And we put him in there and we put both 
the key, his name, and also whatever value were being stored, like his phone number, email address, whatever, if this is the phone book example. Then we want to go ahead and insert somebody else, like let's say Claire. We're gonna decide she goes into slot, I don't know, five. And inside of there, we're gonna put the key, her name Claire, and also her phone number and whatever other info is gonna be stored alongside it. Then when we go to look up Alice and say, hey, we stored Alice's phone number, let's check what it was. We are going to use the same process to decide where she is going to go to figure out where she must have been put. And we're going to look in slot seven and basically know that if Alice is in the table, she has to be in slot seven and find her phone number that way. Likewise, if we wanna find Bob's phone number, we're going to say, oh, Bob, if he's in the table, he has to be in slot three. And so we'll look right in slot three and see if he's here or not. If he's not here, then he can't be in the table. If he is here, then we'll find his data because we know that if Bob's here, he has to be in slot three. And so now the question that you're probably asking is how the heck do we know that Alice is supposed to be in seven, Bob's supposed to be in three, and Claire is supposed to be in five? It seems totally arbitrary. And the way that we know that, the way that we figure that out is with something called a hash function. What we really do is we take the keys, which in this case is the names Alice, Bob, and Claire, and we feed them into this thing that's called the hash function, and it transforms these names somehow into integers. So it really looks like this, where we use this hash function in order to take the string Alice and transform it somehow into the number seven. Likewise, we take the string Bob and we transform it into the string three, and we take the string Claire, which I just realized was spelled wrong, and transform it into the number five. And we use the same hash function, both when we are inserting Alice, Bob, and Claire in the beginning so that we know where to put them in the first place, and then we use it again whenever we need to look up that information. So if we're using the same hash function, and we pass Alice in, we'll get seven every time. So this, this is, can't be like random numbers or anything. It has to produce the same number every single time. So if Alice is there, she has to be in slot seven. So that's the only place in the table we need to look. That's the key idea behind hash tables. It's based on this hash function that transforms your strings into integers somehow. We'll talk about exactly how, of course, next. But you take that integer that it gives you and you use that as the place where you're going to store that key so that you don't have to look through the whole table figuring out where to put Alice. And likewise, when you're searching for Alice, you don't have to search any of the cells except for basically this one right here. And so now the question is, well, how the heck do we figure out how to transform Alice into seven, Bob into three, and Claire into five? How does the hash function itself actually work? Which is what we can talk about now. Well, one way to do it would be to take the string that you have passed in and then find the ASCII code of each letter. So let me pull up the ASCII codes real quick. Okay, there we go. I found this picture on the internet and it has just the ASCII codes for the common letters and such. So what we're going to do is we're going to add up the ASCII code of every character inside of this string and add them all together. So A is 65, little l is 124, the little i is 105, it looks like, the C is 99, and the E is 101. We can take all of those together, those ASCII codes, add them together to get, hold on, let me go to a calculator. Okay, 494. Then we have this really big number that's very, very large and we can't use it by itself directly. And so then what we do is we modulus by 10, the table size. That will ensure that the number that we get on the other side here is between zero and nine. And so modulusing by 10 basically takes the last digit. And so we'll take four. And then four is what we're going to use, in fact, as Alice's index. So let me move her. 
Okay, there we go. So I picked the last, the three, the five, and the seven totally randomly last time. So now using this method for our hash function, we can get that Alice is supposed to go in slot four. So we can go ahead and put her in there along with not only the key, but also whatever other information we need for Alice or phone number or whatever. So that is where she will go. And then if we need to look up Alice, we'll use this exact same method here, adding up all the ASCII codes and dividing, or rather modulusing by 10 to get the same four back so that we know if Alice is in the table, she's in slot four. We can do this again for Bob and see what his value is. So as another quick example, the B is 66. The little O is 111 and the little B is 98. So if we add those together, we'll get 275 as the answer. And then when we modulus by 10 again, this time we get the five here and we'll go ahead and take that as the index for Bob. So we don't need, I don't think, to go through this with Claire, but we would do the same thing. Add up the C-L-A-I-R-E ASCII codes, modulus by 10 to make sure we get a number between zero and nine, and then stick Claire in that slot, whatever it happened to be. So let's go ahead and look at a first example of code that implements this idea of the hash table. All right, so here I have a little skeleton class that we're gonna go ahead and fill in together. The goal of this class is to make a phone book type of thing like we used in the example so far. So we go ahead and we can look at main and see what it does first. We go ahead and make a new phone book object. Then we insert, and every time we insert, we pass both the name, which is the key, and also the phone number that we wanna associate with it. So we insert a bunch of made up names and phone numbers into this phone book. And let's go ahead and implement the hash table idea to go ahead and make this happen. Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and create our array. So let's go ahead and make a private array of strings. And we can go ahead and call it table for hash table. Then we need to determine how big this is going to be. We can go ahead and just make it a constant in the class. Later on, we'll make this like a parameter that can be passed in. But for now, we can just go ahead and hard code it. Static int table size equals. And now we're going to talk about this more in the next lesson on hash tables. But we, when we make a hash table, we want it to be pretty big. We want to have the hash table be big enough that there's empty gaps in there. And we're going to talk about why in a second. And also we want the hash table to usually be an odd number of size. We don't want it to be like an even number, like a thousand. Instead, it's often that we'll pick like a prime number. And we'll talk about this in the next, uh, the next section of this but I'll go ahead and make it 117 size, even though we're only putting these names in here. And uh, even though that's kind of a weird number, not just like, why not just a hundred? And, but we'll, we'll talk about that why, why later. We like to use big numbers that are prime numbers. It works better. And when we get to the analysis, we'll see why. Then inside of here, inside of our constructor, we'll go ahead and allocate space for this. We'll say table equals new, string array of size, table size, like that. And now we can go ahead and look at our insert method. What we need to do first is we need to get the hash value of the name that is given in. And so really before we go ahead and do this, we need to make a hash function. And the way this is going to work is it's going to be a method that returns an integer. It always has to return an integer for a hash table. And it takes in whatever our key is, which in this case is the string name. And like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to add up all of the ASCII codes and then modulus it by the table size. So I can go ahead and start a counter for that at zero. Then we're going to go ahead and we're going to loop from I equals zero through the name dot length going up each one. And then for each character, what we're going to do is we're going to add it into the value. Let's say value equals value plus name dot the character at this I location. So we go ahead 
And for every character in the string that was passed in, we go ahead and add it into the value that we have so far. And then at the end, we just have to modulus that by the table size to make sure it's not too big. So I'm gonna go ahead and return the value mod by table size. When you first learned about the mod operator in like 220 or maybe 110, you're probably like, well, this is a weird thing. How often are we gonna use this remainder division? But it actually turns out like super handy for things like this. It allows us to like wrap this value so that it is less than this number here, which is good because we need to make sure our index isn't too big. Now we can turn back to this insert method, which is going to be pretty simple now, actually. All we have to do is get the index in which we're going to put this name by calling the hash method. So I'm gonna say index is equal to the hash of the name. And then we just go ahead and stick it in the table there. We say table at this index is equal to the number. So in this sort of first simple example, we're only storing the numbers inside of the table. We're not storing the names as well. So that's really all there is to do. We call the hash method to get the index where this person's name is supposed to be stored, and then we just put their phone number in the table at that location. And likewise, looking up a name is equally as simple. What we're going to do is we're going to say int index equals hash of the name again, and now we're just gonna return the table at that location, return table of index. And that should be all that we need to do. So let's go ahead and compile and run this program and see what happens. I can do Java C and I called it hashing one dot Java. Then we can go ahead and run hashing one. And we see that John's number is 6331214, which is right, 6331214. We see that Bob's number is 3458214 which is right, 3458214. So the hash table is able to remember these numbers and produce them back to us. And now let's go ahead and do the analysis for this. And let's start talking about the insert method. Let me pull up the code for it. All right, here we go. So here we have the code for both the hash method and the insert. Now, when we turn to looking at the analysis for it, we can see that the insert method itself does not have any loops at all. So that looks like big O of one, but we have to take into account the fact that we're calling this hash method. Remember the last example from last week on algorithm analysis, any methods you call inside of a method, you have to go ahead and turn the analysis to that. And this method, the hash method itself, does actually have a for loop in it. But we have to think here about what is our n when we're talking about this hash table. Well. The n normally for a hash table isn't the size of your name, how long the strings are. Instead, it's how big your table is. So the table size here is the n. How many things do we have in the hash table altogether? Usually the size of your keys, the name here for instance, is going to be like limited by size to some degree. So we're probably not ever going to see a name that is longer than, I don't know, 25, 50 characters at most. It would be very weird to have a name that's longer than that. And also, if we look at other sort of uh, situations, for example, if you're doing like your student database in a hash table and keeping track of information on students in a hash table, you would probably use like your student, your banner ID as the key and those are limited in length. They're, I don't know, whatever, 10 characters or something like that. So normally in a hash table, the key can be thought of as a relatively small thing in length, and it doesn't matter how big your hash table gets, probably your keys are all going to be relatively small. And so here, the n is not the name.length. Name.length can be taken as sort of a fairly small number, and that's not the thing that is going to be growing as the hash table gets bigger and bigger. We're not gonna have bigger keys, we're just gonna have more and more and more entries in the hash table. So even though this for loop is here, we're going to assume that as the hash table gets bigger, this for loop is not going to take more and more number of iterations. You know, if you go from 
a table of size 1000 to a table of size 1 million, each individual call to hash is not going to take longer because the keys you're passing in are not getting bigger. They're going to be the same relatively small length that they always were. So maybe confusingly, because there is a for loop here, we're going to say that this for loop is bounded and does not grow with n. And so this whole thing is going to be big O of one. Calling hash on a relatively small string is going to take a relatively small amount of time and it doesn't grow as n increases. And so we're going to say this thing is a constant time operation. So we can turn back to the lookup now and we can just go back to the code in, on here and we can see that it's exactly the same as insert. You just call this hash method, which I've argued that as the table itself gets bigger, does not take more and more time because the strings we're passing in are not growing as the table grows. So this is big O of one as well. So based on this hashing technique, we sort of made true on the goal that we set out in the beginning, which is search of big O of one and also insert of big O of one based on this. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, the confusing thing again is that it looks like this is a for loop. So you kind of want to think of this as being big O of N, but this thing here is not our N. <laughs> it's not the table size. It's just the length of any particular string, which I'll argue is going to be small in almost all cases. So the hash tables seem like sort of a panacea right now. They seem to be like, wow, great at searching, great at inserting. But there is sort of a problem with hash tables that we haven't really quite addressed yet, which is what happens if your hash method gives you the exact same number for two things, because it's possible that the hash method will do that, right? If we have Alice and I don't know, Jack, um, I'm not saying this will happen. It probably won't. But if we put this into a hash function, it's possible that it will say the same index for both of them. Maybe it says they both go into slot three. And we know that has to be possible because in this particular instance, we made our table of size 117, but there's a lot more than 117 possible names that we could have put into this hash method. We could put, you know, thousands and thousands of different names. And the hash method gives us a number between zero and 116 for all of them. There has to be some overlaps. So what happens when that occurs? Well, let's go ahead and look at one of the examples in the program we just wrote. Down here at the bottom, it says that Elena's number and Elaine's number is both 6541714. But if we look at the code for this, we'll see that we actually gave them different numbers. Elena, we put in 3473829, and Elaine, we put 6541714. But for both of them, it gave us Elaine's number. And the reason why is because this was a collision. That's what we call it when you have two different keys that the hash method maps to the same index. It's a collision. And our code that we have right now didn't notice or detect or deal with this problem at all. It just happily went ahead and overwrote Elaine's phone number on top of Elena's. So in the next video, we're going to have to talk about how do we handle these collisions. By the way, our, it should be easy to see that this is going to be a collision based on the way that we know our hash method works because it just goes ahead and adds up the ASCII codes for all of the letters. And if you notice, they're the same letters in these two names. It's just the A and the E are swapped around. So we get the same number and then we mod it by 117 and we get, of course, the same answer. And so they both go into the same cell of the array. So hash tables are super duper efficient but there's this one problem that we haven't addressed yet, which is what to do with collisions. In the next lesson on this, we're gonna talk about different ways of handling these collisions and how that affects the analysis of the best case scenario of it being big O of one for both search and insert. So I'll see you next time for that.